Hello, everyone, and welcome to the talk, Phenomenology of the Flickr, Videographic Thought and Radically Interdisciplinary Intersectionality, delivered by Dr. Ben Spatz. This uh, talk is part of the Oxford Feminist Thinking Seminars, which are organized by the 2022-2023 MST cohort in Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies here at Oxford. My name is Sammy Wimes, and I'll be facilitating today's event. We're thrilled to be hosting Dr. Spatz today to share their research on how a phenomenology of the flicker can be used to rethink the digital identity politics of gender and race and videographic thought. So please post any questions in the chat box as we go along and we'll do our best to answer them all at the end of the session in our discussion time. Now to introduce our speaker for today, Ben Spatz, they them, is a non-binary scholar practitioner working at the intersections of artistic research and critical theories of embodiment and identity. They're a reader in media and performance at University of Huddersfield, editor of the videographic Journal of Embodied Research, and a leader in the development of new audiovisual embodied research methods. More information about Dr. Spatz's work can be found at urbanresearchtheater.com. And now, Ben, I'll let you take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sammy, um, for inviting me. Uh, I I can't see this. The format is I can't see anybody or or tell that anyone is there. But I'm going to assume that some people are there and speak into the, um, the the void of the Zoom. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really um, really deeply honored to be in this seminar series um, presenting some of my current research and current thinking. Um, I have a, a whole bunch of materials that I'd like to share that range over um, a number of different contexts, and I'm going to be sharing um, different ideas and concepts along the way that have evolved alongside um, some artistic and embodied experiments. Um, so I'll be talking kind of conceptually about these ideas of videographic thought in the context of radically interdisciplinary intersectionality, but I'm also going to be um, then focusing on the Journal of Embodied Research, so some audiovisual and videographic works that I've edited or curated, and then in the last part I'll be talking about my own embodied artistic research um, and right up to some current experiments that are very much underway. So I, um, I'm really looking forward to any conversation that people would like to have afterwards. Um, comments, questions, thoughts, connections. Of course, there's a lot of material that I am not sharing today that's in the background. I hope there will be some um, sense of, of, of what's in the background there. I've tried to focus things as much as possible around this idea of videographic thought. Um, chiming with the feminist thinking seminar series and asking what it means to think in the form of video and um, what it means to take seriously video as a form of thought. Thinking in a quite interdisciplinary context, um, there is of course a very long history of what we could call uh, videographic thinking. Uh, before that, maybe audiovisual thinking, we can call it thinking through images, cinematic thinking, the film essay, um, film as thought. I mean, all of these things have been circulating for decades, uh, if not longer. And then there's a, there's a huge body of work that I'm only will touch on of critical humanities perspectives, um, whether from film studies or from feminist studies, queer studies, critical race studies on audiovisual production, films, music videos, all of these kinds of things as modes of thought. What I think is relatively new is that um, videographic production becomes formally a question for academic thought itself. So rather than um, seeing a role uh, in the university as only to do textual analysis of um, videographic works or cinematic works, uh, to actually sit down at the editing desk and to say, kind of ask us a question, what does it look like when someone coming from critical humanities or indeed from performing arts, which is the other part of my background, sits down at the editing desk, what kind of thought might unfold there? And I'm inspired very much uh, from the, the work that's developed in videographic film criticism, 
um, where that exact thing has happened. But I'm also looking back to the very long histories of something like visual anthropology, which is a scholarly discipline that has a very long history of producing audiovisual works. So these are all kind of some of the broad context. I'm trying to narrow things down because it can be quite dizzying. And then, uh, you know, you think about the, the last 10 years of social media, the way in which we're in a constant audiovisual flow, many of us today, where uh, we may be watching a film, watching television, then we're shifting to social media. There's a huge wash of many different kinds of video materials juxtaposed with textual materials. And then from that, we switch to something like this. Um, a Zoom presentation or a Zoom chat, where again, it's a kind of audiovisual thinking actually that's unfolding here through that through those channels. Um, and then that can all be very overwhelming. So I'm, I'm trying to kind of boil it down to what questions can we ask from a critical humanities perspective? What questions can we ask uh, connecting critical humanities to performing arts? So I'll start with a sort of a, a particle of thought, which is the as. The, um, the as statement, the positionality or situatedness, uh, situating statement where I present myself as something. Um, I've already presented myself as someone who works in the university, who kind of sees this project as a kind of intervention in the university as a structure, as a form, a social form. Um, and I've also presented myself as someone who moves between critical humanities, very influenced by feminist theory, queer theory, uh, and, and more recently very much by critical black studies and critical indigenous studies um, in thinking about audiovisual production, but also with a background in performing arts, in theater, theater research, laboratory theater, and theater that sees itself as investigating questions through embodied practices of movement and song. So those are my kind of some disciplinary backgrounds. For me, those are also not really at all separable from um, what are sometimes classified as personal identities of gender and race, um, because I'm actually trying to think through my own embodied identities through those very forms, um, through critical humanities, through performing arts. Those are all forms of, of trying to kind of grapple with like, who, who am I? Um, and, and it seems that uh, in this period of my life, at least, there are uh, different ways that I might frame or position myself, different ways that I might speak as something. Um, and one very obvious thing is, for example, if I connect to the Zoom webinar, uh, it says Ben Spatz, but I could change the name. So it says Ben Spatz, they, them, and it tags these pronouns on, or I can I can present myself as non-binary in the in the, bi in the bio as having non-binary gender, and this changes something. But what does it exactly change when I make that announcement? Right, it's not actually changing my my body in that moment particularly. Um, but there's a juxtaposition there of the the the, the textual, the label, um, the the naming of that of that, and and what I'm presenting audiovisually, how I appear, how I appear with my voice, how I appear with my face here. Um, and in, in the other part of my work, that is what I'm going to present on later, I'm trying to think about those um, kind of identities that we think of as gender in a dynamic relation with gen with identities that we, well, that I'm starting to think of more in terms of race, um, thinking about, I'm not going to go deep into this now because I'll save it for later, but thinking about Jewishness and diasporic Jewishness, particularly the politics of diasporic Jewishness, which I've come to think of very much in relationship to whiteness and trying to understand the entanglement of Jewishness and whiteness in the present moment, um, very problematic entanglements, and is there a possibility of disentangling those things? These are all kind of different as statements that could be made, um, that I could make that would position me differently. And this is actually what I mean by the flicker um, in the first instance, is that um, depending on how I place these labels in relation to, first of all, my, my body that I'm in, but also I mean it really audiovisually. So as I might appear on screen now, as I might appear in a video, when I sort of tag myself with these different labels, um, as I situate a relationship towards identity like non-binary, identity like man or masculine, or you know, something more specific like soft butch, um, or towards whiteness or towards Jewishness or different ways of claiming or not claiming or identifying or disidentifying, there's a flicker. There's a flicker of meaning there that I'm trying to catch uh, and to think in this, I'm gonna keep talking about juxtapositions between textual and audiovisual, and I'm gonna keep picking that up um, throughout this talk. 
So that's kind of the starting point for what I mean by, by Flickr. And what I want to say about the as statement briefly is um, <clears throat> I'm responding to some critiques of the as statement, which are just kind of, I would say, reductive critiques of what's called identity politics. There's one by Anthony of Haya where he says the as statement is not meaningful because, of course, you can't tell what someone is going to say based on what identity they're part of, and blah, blah, blah. Um, I, I think what I want to highlight with regard to the as statements and the, how we position ourselves is that it's a double direction. It's a double direction. So it's not when I say I'm speaking as, let's say, a non-binary person in a given moment, I'm not only um, naming a kind of solid, static, sedimented identity, which then in some way explains or expresses itself in the argument that I'm going to give or the, uh, the ideas that I'm going to put forward. It's the other way as well. So the things that I'm saying, the arguments I'm going to make, the images that I'm going to show, um, are, I'm also claiming it. I'm claiming it in both directions. I'm saying that these, these ideas that are coming up, these proposals I'm making, these arguments I'm making, I'm making them as this. And therefore, I'm also constructing in that moment what this identity is. Um, even simply to say, the, uh, as I said before, the humanities scholar or the performing artist sits down at the editing desk, what kind of thought do they enact? Um, it's not only to say that there exists these static disciplinary identities of performing artist or critical humanities scholar, which then have to express themselves newly in a um, in videographic form. It's also the other, other direction as well, because I'm also in that moment saying that I sit down at the video editing desk as these things, as a performing artist, as a critical humanities thinker, and that's different from how someone else might edit a video. And so I'm also embracing the video editing process as part of those disciplinary identities. And I think that that back and forth is very, very important. That's by way of a kind of prelude to the idea of the flicker, to some of my own identifications and to the kind of questions that I'm trying to ask through working with video. Um, there's, as I mentioned, there's like a huge, huge um, critical context that I could invoke here, but I don't want to actually spend most of the time um, with critical theories and analyses of videographic thought. I want to speak more from practical experimentation today. Um, there is there is one touchstone that I do want to start with, however. Uh, I was trying to decide who, who this would be. I mean, I, I want to mention um, Eliza Steinbach's work on shimmering images on trans identity in relation to cinematic production, which is really, really important for me. And also Kara Keeling's work, which I quoted in the description about digital identity politics, um, or I might say audiovisual identity politics about, again, thinking a, a number of years ago about how the politics of identity in a broad sense and not reductive to kind of identity politics, but the broad politics of identity, identification, the politics of how we understand human beings to be in, in groupings of any kind, how that is changed by, by a digital environment, by an audiovisual environment, by a flow of audiovisual images. Those are touchstones that I'm not going uh, deep into, but I wanted to mention. What I actually want to start with um, before I go into the, 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 the material that is um, stuff that I've edited or stuff that's created is um, Tiffany Latabo King's book, The Black Shoals. I can get it to not blur. Okay, it's blurring. Uh, it's called The Black Shoals, and um, in it, there's a reading of Julie Dash's 1991 film, Daughters of the Dust. And I want to start with this, um, this chapter. I'm going to read a few, a few bits of it um, while I let you see a little clip that's relevant from it. Um, this book is very, very influential to me in a lot of different ways, and I'll, and I'll mention a few of those after I read a few Excerpts from it. So King writes, around 2011, the hue indigo black, that's in quotes, or indigo stained black skin pierced my cornea and grafted itself onto my eye. While I had viewed the film Daughters of the Dust countless times before 2011, it was in the context of reflecting on conquest and the relationship between black enslavement and indigenous genocide that I found the stained hands of Nana Pizant and her kin who worked the indigo plantation arresting. From 2011 until now, the very idea that the cultivation of violet plants and the crude chemistry involved in their conversion into indigo dye 
so the conversion of violet plants into indigo dye, could have an afterlife on the skin, perhaps across generations, has inhabited a small corner of my mind. King goes on to uh, go in, into a description of the film, um, which I'll skip that part and just come over to a few parts that I want to highlight. King writes uh, porosity and fungibility, key concepts here in, in, in Black Studies more generally, are elusive and difficult to visualize because they cannot be captured through, to just through traditional modes of seeing. Porosity and fungibility are elusive and difficult to visualize because they cannot be captured through traditional modes of seeing. Dash, for instance, had to use creative license and stain her actor's hands blue, a stain that would not appear to the human eye off screen to depict the scars left on black bodies from indigo processing. Uh, and there's an interview in which Dash refers to this blueness as the stain of slavery. I'll read one more, uh, one more line from, from King about this, um, this use of the blue in the film. King writes, the indigo stain is knowable only at the molecular level, wherein slaves are poisoned and die by the process. It is perceptible to the human eye only through decolonial art, such as dashes. The indigo stain is knowable only at the molecular level and perceptible to the human eye only through decolonial art, such as dashes. The regime of colonial visuality also hides aspects of conquest, such as genocide. Specifically, the colonial regime of visuality obscures and makes invisible the genocide of the Yamasee and indigenous people of the Sea Islands. So I'm going to draw a few concepts um, from this book, which is incredibly uh, rich and, and in some way I feel like a lot of the stuff that I'm actually talking about today in my own work is a kind of response to not only to this book, but I find a lot of things in this book that I really um, call me to respond. One of them is this idea of molecules. Um, so this reading that King enacts of, of this film, Daughters of the Dust, in which uh, essentially, what I what I understand her to be saying is that there's a capacity in the film here to reveal something about uh, indigo molecules, the chemical indican, about these molecules, about their history, uh, very much about their materiality. And she writes about their invocation with the bodies, uh, both historically and in the film. Um, that is not only not perceivable to let's say a biochemical techno-scientific analysis of the molecules but actually excluded by it right a bio biochemical techno-scientific analysis of, of indigo or indican molecules would strictly uh reduce them to their chemical structure and thereby strictly separate them from exactly the kind of history and absorption of bodies that uh, Dash in the film is making visible in a different way. And so that's not to get rid of a uh, techno-scientific idea of molecules, of course, but I think it is to take steps towards what I'm calling a radically interdisciplinary intersectionality. And what I mean by that, that radically interdisciplinary is coming from Rosamond King, which is not related, Rosamond King's article on um, radical interdisciplinarity, thinking about biomythography and writings of people like Audre Lorde and Goran Zaldua, and thinking about experimental modes of writing, poetic modes of writing, which have more recently developed in Cynthia Hartman's work, but thinking about these as other forms of knowledge uh, and not allowing, not accepting a hierarchy of knowledge in which a techno-scientific or biochemical analysis of these molecules would give us kind of the real indigo molecule and then stacked on top of that would be something like historical or cultural interpretation. Um, for me, this is a really important shift uh, in the way of thinking about film and particularly film or video as a, as a, as a, as a, as a form of knowledge. Um, thinking about the molecules that are enacted in the video, thinking about the blueness, the blue, the blue color that's used here, the color that's used audiovisually to indicate something which would not be perceptible 
uh, on a biochemical level would not be perceptible on a sort of strictly historical accuracy level, right? Like this chemical does not stain you blue in that way is what I understand from the chapter. Uh, and yet what, what we're given to understand from King is that this is not, uh, we shouldn't, we can't demote this as some kind of poetic afterthought, but rather this is a kind of knowledge. And I think uh, King calls it decolonial knowledge or decolonial artistic practice. So this for me is a really important touchstone, a way of thinking about molecules that goes beyond. And of course, in the molecular, I am also thinking about Deleuze and Guattari. It's a whole other story, but um, a way of thinking about, uh, of putting different disciplinary perspectives on knowledge into a kind of conversation with each other that doesn't enact this uh, scientific hierarchy. And part of what's going on there is about the asymmetry of molecules, um, which I would apply to a lot of different things that appear in video in video work. And I will give a lot more examples in a few minutes, but um, the kinds of things that can appear in, in videos, uh, which we have even on the screen now, the way that the, the, the there are voices, there is music, there's actually a textual annotation layer there as well. There's the blue color, there's the actors, there's the identities of the actors, there's the identities of the characters, there's the script, there's the improvisation, there's the location. I mean, the, the, it's more than location, there's the emplacement of the practice of the performance, which is then recorded. All of these things, um, I think that, I guess part of what I'm trying to, to do as I use some of this work in critical black and critical native studies as a leverage point to think about videographic thought is to, clear away some of the disciplinary assumptions and hierarchies about what we're seeing in a video. Um, that we might assume certain production processes, whether it's a documentary, or whether it's fiction or historical fiction, that we might assume um, certain kinds of structures to, to what we're seeing in a video, fiction versus nonfiction, um, different relationship to history, to scripting, to production processes, actor-director relationships, all of these things um, that we have to kind of re- reapproach them quite critically uh, and think about them in asymmetrical relationship to each other. I say asymmetry and uh, maybe I won't go too far into that idea, but the idea is that molecules are much more asymmetrical uh, from each other than we often think of, for example, identities. If I take identities as an example, um, if I think about, for example, in this book, um, King is talking about relations between Black and Native identities, including overlaps and connections and where those are the same and where they're different and what kinds of conversations can be had from those positionalities. In my own research that I will address in a bit, uh, I'm actually looking, as I mentioned, at Jewishness and whiteness, but I'm only looking at Jewishness and whiteness from a perspective that's informed by indeed Blackness and indigeneity. So um, thinking about these identities, we can very often be trapped, I think, into a kind of symmetrical view of identity, uh, which I, I would call like a demographic epistemology or a census epistemology. And I think we know what I'm talking about here when I say like identity is understood as individual attributes which are attached to people. And so that means that the way you are, the way someone might be white would be the same kind of thing as what it might mean to be black or to be Jewish or to be indigenous. And of course that isn't true at all. Um, and particularly the radical interdisciplinarity of looking at these fields in relation to each other and of thinking from these critical humanities fields is to reveal and to understand that these relate that these these identities are not symmetrical. They're not properties like uh, like a like something that someone has and then they might have a different one. Um, they are these massively asymmetrical histories, histories of power, but not only power, histories of power and also histories of knowledge. Uh, and that makes them radically, asymmetrical and that means that the way they appear uh, in in writing of course also but but particularly maybe in audiovisual form um, has to be understood with this asymmetry. I could say more about that let me go on. Um, the last thing I want to mention on this page which I've kind of already addressed is forms of knowledge um, and and again to see a film like this as a form of knowledge um, to take that as an example uh, and as a reference point and to say, Okay, actually, so much of the structure of what we often call knowledge production in the university, so much of the structure of the university itself as a social form, and of what we call research and of what we call knowledge uh, is structured historically, and uh, because of colonial and patriarchal and other histories, um, is structured in relation to particular forms of knowledge, particularly um, writing and certain kinds of writing. Uh, particularly 
alphabetic writing, writing with alphabetic letters. Um, and here I'm thinking of um, Brigitte Rasmussen's work on the imposition of European writing forms in the Americas. But I think it's something that, again, rather than try to, to speak in a historical way, um, not speaking particularly as a historian, I'd like to speak in a practical way about how I encounter um, the relationship between different forms of knowledge um, and how some of the ways that I've tried to a little bit understand how they relate to each other or work with them or try to find even potentially new forms. So for that, I'm gonna transition uh, towards talking about the, the Journal of Embodied Research. This is a journal that I founded in 2017. And the first issue was 2018. So um, it's been about five or six years um, now watching this journal grow and trying to foster this journal. And I would say the journal is defined by two things. Again, immediately starting from this juxtaposition of audiovisual forms of knowledge and the, 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 the textual, meaning the, the phonetic, the alphabetic. There's the title of the journal, which is the Journal of Embodied Research, which already makes some kind of claim or some kind of statement that there is such a thing called embodied research or there's an interdisciplinary area called embodied research um, and puts that forward. But then the, the form of the journal, which is equally part of its meaning and its identity is that it is exclusively videographic. So we publish video essays, um, which following peer review processes, I call video, we call video articles. So we publish video articles. Um, we don't publish textual articles. Uh, and we also don't publish uh, multimedia articles. So there are more and more journals, for example, that will publish video as part of a textual work. Um, you might have a primarily textual argument or primarily textual flow. And then inside of that, there might be video. There's something called, there's a journal called the Journal for Artistic Research, which is probably the best known artistic research platform. And they have a their own coded platform called the Research Catalog, which allows you to juxtapose sound, video, image, text in different ways through that platform. So that's its own form of knowledge in a sense. In this journal, the Journal of Embodied Research, we work specifically with the form of knowledge that is a video file. And I'm talking a little bit logistics now. So it's kind of like I'm reducing from these very broad and historically and politically engaged questions to some really logistical, technological, formal questions. But I actually think that that's quite important to do because I think that as we as we work in whatever relationship we have to academia, whether we're distant from it or in it or on the border or we're right embedded in the institution, which institution, uh, we do need to think about the technologies and the logistics of the institution. We do need to think about publishing and the forms of publishing and the forms of knowledge really, right? Because the forms of knowledge are inextricably interwoven with the knowledge itself. There's no separation that you can make them. So it matters to me that we don't publish um, text outside of video. What we do is we publish video files and then there are associated textualities, textual elements that go along with every video article. But um, for example, there's a set of metadata that every article must have, again, if it's going to interface with the dominant structures, very dominant at this point, uh, almost uniquely so, uh, dominant structures of, of, of academic knowledge production, right? I mean, what would it even mean to put forward, uh, you know, a piece of paper here, like, or just napkin and to call it an article? I could do that, but it can't be part of the article um, ecology unless it follows a certain form. So it needs to have, for example, the, the journal needs to have a title. It needs to be a textual title, which is Journal of Body Research. A given article needs to have its own title. It needs to have uh, a journal number, issue number, volume number. It needs to have author data, data about the authors. It needs to have an abstract. It needs to have keywords. All of these are textual elements, and they need to be separable to some extent from the video in order to, again, be absorbable into the scholarly forms of knowledge that define the university and university publication. But what we don't do is we don't keep them outside the video. So all of the metadata that goes along with the video must be inside the video file. So it's a reversal of the topology. It's something simple, but I think quite interesting. The topology is reversed where textual elements are inside the video. That means the video itself includes the journal title, the journal um, logo, the issue number, the volume number, the, 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 the article itself has to include the title of the article, the author, it has to include the abstract and the keyword. So there isn't any text that you can't find in the video. 
Um, that means the video article is itself the core item that we publish and all of the textual elements are kind of derivative of that. And there's more to say about the relationships between, I mean, this is what I've really come to understand or seen unfolding over the past five years of working on this journal is that the relationships, well, I guess my thinking about the relationship between textuality and audiovisuality has really has really changed. I'm, I think in the beginning, I wasn't really thinking in those terms exactly. I was um, a, 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 a number of years ago, maybe more seven or eight years ago, I, I used to make video essays that were much more formal, almost like trying to be scientific, um, really kind of uh, trying to be objective where uh, the, the, the bodies on screen were doing something and then the, the, the voiceover or the textual annotations would kind of objectively analyze it. Um, as things have gone on, obviously, I've realized that that's a very specific, very narrow um, kind of form of knowledge. And actually what we're doing in the journal, I think, is really exploring and, and playing, particularly, of course, with different kinds of writing, different kinds of textuality, different kinds of audiovisuality, which means different modes of recording, different strategies of using the camera, different techniques of production, but also very much the relationships between these modes of producing writing textuality and modes of producing audiovisuality. So just looking at these, this is a selection of five clips from excerpts from five um, articles that have been published in the journal. And already you can see here a huge variety of relationships between textuality and audiovisuality, right? Here you can see, for example, handwriting on the screen. Um, at that moment, I'm not giving you the audio here, but at that moment, there's also a voiceover and that's, you're seeing the, the uh, subtitles of the voiceover on the bottom of the screen. Um, in the video on the top left, there's a very interesting kind of, um, it's not exactly a voiceover because it was recorded at the same time as the video. So the video is recorded on a GoPro, a head mounted GoPro, and the person who's recording is also speaking the entire time about what they're doing. So it's like a running commentary. So that's a kind of um, textuality in the video. And then at one moment that you just saw, that's also augmented by a scrolling textuality of written text. So it's a, it's a different temporality than a voiceover because the voice that's speaking is at the same time as the as the recording is being made. And if you look at the bottom left, that's also true in, in the Arlander's piece where a letter is scrolling up the screen that Annette is writing to the olive tree, dearest olive tree. I don't know if you can see that. It says dearest olive tree and the letter is scrolling up. But what we see in the video, and this was part of a special call for uncut video. So it's actually 20 minutes of her sitting on the tree and writing to the tree is she's sitting there uh, and writing a letter to the tree. And so if we assume, which I think is correct, that the, the letter that's scrolling up the screen is not written afterwards, but is written in the moment that she's sitting on the tree, but she's of course handwriting it in a notebook and later it's typed up and then it's coming up the screen. But actually it's a similar temporal relationship where the textuality is being produced at the moment of the video recording. Um, so th these are just, I'm kind of just pointing out to a few different things. Um, in the in the video on the middle left, there's something happening where of course in the center, there's a, a, a bunch of um, quotations and philosophical conversation. The, uh, the actors on the left and the right are speaking um, a kind of a neutral script, but they're being given the neutral script in real time by someone else who we can't see. So actually everything that they say is doubled where they, they hear a line and then they say the line. And so we're hearing the line and then we're seeing someone speaking the line. Uh, and that is another kind of textuality and a kind of doubling. On the right top now, you see um, some performers uh, who were performing in the work of the performance artist who is, whose work we're, was mentioned before in that screen. Uh, they're talking, they're answering questions in response to a bunch of cards, and then those, those, their, their responses are also subtitled. So there's this, there's this great richness, which I feel like, um, is 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 narrow enough and small enough and contained enough now because of the the way that technologies have developed that we can really um, we can really think to bring our critical faculties to bear uh, in 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 other ways about well how how exactly is this is this being filmed and and how exactly is this being produced and 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 particularly what exactly is the relationship between textuality and audiovisuality in the frame. And then I want to say something else about this relationship between textuality and audiovisuality, because so far I've been describing it as if there is this thing called textuality. And 
And then of course, this other thing called audiovisual recording where we use the camera and we actually trace a, a moving image and a sound of something that's happening in the world. And then we put these two things together. And for the most part, from a practical perspective, that's absolutely correct. I mean, if I sit down at the video editing table, um, the video editing program does know the difference between the video inputs and if I put a text on it, right? It has to hold the text as a text in order to put the text on top of the video. But it's also true that when I export the video into an MP4 format, um, that difference in a certain sense disappears. And the MP4 format, the audiovisual format, or, or what I'm going to call actually the videographic format uh, that we see on the screen, the video file does not know any longer that there's a difference between textual material and audiovisual material. Um, it's only in that moment of writing, the act of writing, that this distinction is, is, is sharp. And this has a, a, some implications that I want to tease out a little bit. I'm thinking again of Rasmussen's work on the colonial imposition of European alphabetic phonetic forms of writing. So thinking a little bit from the other side of the process, again, as the journal editor, every video article that's published by Journal of Embodied Research, we publish with the metadata that I mentioned, so the article title, the, uh, the author data, abstract keywords, list of references also, is pulled out of the video um, and, and goes into sort of other kinds of boxes so that it can be indexed, so that it can be searched, so that it can integrate with the ecosystem of scholarly publishing. And we also publish what we like to call, although it's never quite complete, a complete transcript of the video. And this is something that I did just at the beginning. I thought we should have a transcript, right? I mean, scholarly publishing is, is made to publish PDFs. Um, but we publish mp4s but we should also have a pdf because there's a slot on the system to have a pdf so what would the pdf be it's a transcript of the video it's a transcript of, what does that mean it's all the verbal content all the textual content of the video is put into a a, a word file that becomes a pdf but um the more i've thought about this and the more i've done this and the more transcripts we create it begins to become clear to me that it's only the act of writing transcription that actually allows me in the first place to make a distinction between the textual and the audiovisual content of a video article. So what is a complete video article transcript? When I look at the video article, right? I mean, just, just maybe pausing this one for a moment, um, if I'm able to go back, let's see if I can. Uh, yeah, so we've got the handwriting. Um, oh, he's, oh, I'm looking at the top right video. I've got the handwriting uh, and we've got the subtitle. Now the subtitle from the voiceover is um, written in a, obviously a digital typeface. So that's quite directly transcribable. We also have the handwriting. The handwriting is interesting because it's not directly transcribable, right? I'm, I'm not gonna be able to transcribe the rhythm and the kind of signature quality of the handwriting, but there is a way in which I can extract the letters actually what i'm extracting is the letters and the punctuation the letters and the punctuation and in a sense the same is true for the voiceover itself which you can't hear but the voiceover that's being transcribed on the bottom that voiceover also can't be fully directly transcribed the timbre of the voice the, the pauses the, the quality of the speaking cannot be transcribed but again there's this operation where i can extract we can extract what we then call the textual content of the video, but it's only the act of transcription that allows us to make this cut, if you see what I mean. Um, it's, it's because, it's, it's when we sit down to transcribe some elements of the video that we are able to say, oh, those are the textual elements of the video, whereas the kind of, signature style quality of the handwriting or the, the auditory quality of the voice. That's not textual because we can't write it down. Now we can describe, we can describe the video. And in the longer um, context of general of embodied research, I, I very much would like to think about audio description as a possibility for accessibility reasons. Um, but description, audio description is very different from transcription. At least, at least practically, right? And again, I'm speaking from a practical experimental 
um, perspective, first of all. Um, when I think about integrating audio description into Journal of Embodied Research, that seems actually quite challenging because I'm not sure that just anybody who does audio description can simply sit down and do the descriptions. I mean, it's possible, um, but I think there are a lot of questions there. It's like having somebody do the index for your book. Doing the index for a book you're, you're, or doing the description of the video, you're, you're very much choosing which things uh, you want to describe and how to describe them, right? I mean, certainly things like ascribing identities to people can be hugely loaded. Um, or even to places. That's a little bit true with transcription in the sense that, okay, if the video shows us, you know, we're going down a street and there's a street sign and the street sign has the name of the street on it, do I choose to transcribe that? But I mean, I tend to say, yes, we try to be comprehensive. And I just say, if there's a word on the screen, we transcribe it. If someone says something and it's recognizable as a word, if you think you could put into letters what they said, we transcribe it. It's not, it's not by any means a clean cut, but it is something quite technologically interesting when you think about our relationship to the dominant structures of logocentric academic production, when you think about that in the history of European colonialism, the dominance of European languages uh, and of phonetic, uh, sorry, of alphabetic writing, the way in which every object on the internet has to have uh, alphabetic and numerical references, otherwise it can't be found. Um, even a video file that has no text in it must have, and particularly to be a, an, an, an article, but even not to be an article, it needs a URL at least. Everything needs to be lettered in this way. Uh, and so the fact that it, that there's a, there's a sort of flipping, again, a topological flipping that can happen where you notice that actually it isn't that there are, there's this thing called textuality which exists independently as if ontologically and it's then combined with audiovisuality, but rather there's something, there's an operation of transcription, which allows us to cut out from the video and from life, right, from, from everyday life, to cut out what we then call language. It's quite, a, it's quite a shift, it's quite a shift. And this is what I want to point towards with the idea of videographic thought, is that in, in videographic thought, we, we don't necessarily, um, we're not primarily thinking in terms of that cut, right? So the transcript of the video article comes afterwards. It's very secondary uh, to the video article, as is the abstract. The video article itself, within the frame, within the audiovisual medium, the, the form of knowledge, does not make such a sharp distinction. There's actually many different ways in which textuality can appear, everything from a road sign to a piece of handwriting. Um, we have writing that you don't see, we have speaking, speaking can be more or less clear. Um, the complexity of, of what might be considered textual versus audiovisual is a place where I think we, we can actually find quite a bit of leverage to then perhaps return to some of the assumptions we make about thought and about thinking and how we continue, uh, even in the most radically critical contexts, if we're in an academic disciplinary context, we are always continually returning to alphabetic writing uh, as thought, as the mode of thinking. And I think that to take seriously this videographic thought as a different space in which the division, even the division between textuality and or language and other kinds of uh, knowledges is not actually material. It doesn't become material until a later act of transcription gives us, a, I think, quite a different perspective on, on something like thought or knowledge. So um, that's, that's, that's what I think the Journal of Artistic Research is really doing. I think we're exploring videographic thought. Uh, and of course, the third term here, textuality, audiovisuality, the third term would be embodiment, as in the title of the journal, Journal of Embodied Research. And then I would add very much, I would add emplacement. So we could think about embodiment and emplacement in relation to textuality and then in relation to audiovisuality and how different those are and how videographic thought might allow us to think in new ways about both embodiment and emplacement. So now I'm gonna shift from this journal that I edit towards my own artistic research, uh, my own practices. Uh, and I have been showing you a number of videos without any sound. So what I'm gonna try to do now is show you a clip with sound, of course, I have to pause my, my talk. This is about three minutes long, I think. Um, it's from a, a, a video article um, called Whiteness published in Performance Philosophy. 
and I'll just show you a small a small clip, and then I'll I'll talk to you about what I think is going on, some of the things I think are going on there. Interrupt me, please, if you if you're not getting the sound. So this um, this video is quite simple in form. The underlying video recording is about twelve minutes long. It's uncut, unbroken. Uh, it's from my twenty seventeen lab period, where there were about six months where I had external funding to do some laboratory research coming out of performing arts again, um, but in dialogue with the critical humanities around the question of contemporary diasporic Jewish identity and the politics of Jewish identity. Um, just to say again about the form of the video. So in the video, you see me and Ilona in the studio, um, who was a PhD student of mine at that time. And there's also two other people. Of course, there's one Edda you saw in the background who was in the role of kind of a guide or a supporter or a director who, who who mostly stayed on the outside but gave a few indications or joined in with her voice and there's Agnieszka Mendel who's holding the camera and the four of us are working together in this space and um, what arises is something that I'm thinking of as a kind of videographic thought it's it's later in the process that I put this text on it and so during the video essay um, there are three moments where the image is cut off and a text is imposed on it in this way that you see here. Uh, it's um, the sound continues. So the, actually the sound from the session is continuous throughout the whole video essay, which, which gives it a certain continuity, but the image is replaced by this text. And the text in each case is a sort of commentary in the lighter color, which, which, which appears first, and then a bunch of 
um, citations. And when I think about the videographic thought here, part of it is that it's it's impossible to to articulate what this video is trying to say um, without both of the without both of the aspects, without the audiovisual layer, with the image, with the movement, and then the sound coming across, and then the text. And what I mean by that is, so this is a project to explore diasporic Jewish identity. Uh, it's a kind of an investigation of political uh, investigation of the politics of embodied practice, embodied research through a kind of theater laboratory methodology. At the time that we recorded this video, there was no sense that what we were working on in the studio was whiteness. So the title whiteness is coming several years later. This was 2017 and it was published in 2022. So possibly four, three, four, five years later, I'm looking at this video material. I have a large archive. We have a large archive of video material from those sessions. And I'm saying, I think that in some way, what's going on here in this video is actually about whiteness and that's what I want to articulate. Um, now it's not the case that I'm simply imposing something on it that has nothing to do with it. Ilona at the time is working on extended voice and boundaries between the human and the animal. Because she's exploring boundaries between the human and the animal, because she's exploring pushing her voice, pushing extended voice into a kind of what an animalistic territory or a territory that pushes the boundaries of what we understand as the human. Because she's doing that, that's why I decide to bring into the studio this book by Giorgio Agamben called The Open, which is about the relationship between humanity and animals or the animal. At the time that I bring it into the studio, I have not read this book. I've read some other Agamben, but I don't know what's in that book. So, but I bring it in because it's about human and animal. So the book is in the studio. It's another element. It's another audiovisual molecule that's present with us in relation to Ilona's work on extended voice and my own work and the whole space of that laboratory. It's only a few years later that I'm coming to understand that when I think about Jewishness, I always need to be thinking about it in relation to whiteness. And moreover, when I think about relations between the human and the animal in Agamben's terms, I always need to be thinking about critiques from critical blackness and radical black studies. I need to be thinking about Agamben, for example, in, 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 in relation to Alexander Wahaliye, whose, whose work is cited there. So then I start to reframe the same video material how would I talk about the way in which whiteness is at present, is present or at stake, the way in which it informs the structure? How can I uh, interact with it? So one thing is that this textual um, annotation does not gently appear on the, on the video. It really cuts into it. Uh, and that's because of this kind of critical perspective, right? I'm trying to actually, in a way, critique or question what we're doing, but I'm, I'm not, uh, dismantling what we're doing. I'm not throwing out what we're doing, obviously, because I'm still putting it forward in the audiovisual form. So I'm putting forward the audiovisual form of the practice. I'm putting forward the embodied research in its audiovisual form while critiquing it um, in a textual way, starting from Agamben. So starting from what Agamben is saying about Heidegger and disembodiment, the world having nothing to offer, uh, and then connecting this to whiteness through Kassan Haj and Alexander Rehelie and Ian Balcom and people who are much more explicitly critical about whiteness from racialized perspectives, um, connecting that to Patrick Wolf, connecting that to uh, Max Le Boron, and, and so putting a totally different context on it. And it's this juxtaposition where I'm looking for something called videographic thought, or where I'm looking to articulate something about whiteness in this practice, uh, in my research, but in a form that can't be done through only writing, and neither can it be done through a theatrical performance. It needs to be done through a, a, this kind of videographic thought. This is one example um, of an essay from the Judaica Project, a video essay. I've been a very briefly, oh, sorry, I wanted to touch on a few concepts that are related to this. So of course, diaspora, a diasporic Jewish perspective being crucial to understanding the relations between Jewishness and whiteness in the contemporary political moment. Um, extended Talmud is a concept which I probably shouldn't go into right now, but it has to do with the way that I'm understanding language here uh, and textuality and particularly critical thought and critical theory, um, because I have been talking even today about how certain forms of writing and logocentrism are deeply interwoven with coloniality. And yet I'm also always reserving, of course, that there is a critical potential of writing that is anti-colonial or decolonial. Uh, and that may be associated with various
various things, but one thing that I would certainly want to associate it with is lineages of Jewish reading and writing, um, Jewishness in its distinction from whiteness as being potentially other modes of reading and writing and therefore other modes of uh, textual thinking. Finally, Illuminations um, is, of course, a, like a reference to Walter Benjamin, but mostly it's a topological reversal of the idea of the illuminated manuscript. Um, so where an illuminated manuscript might be a primarily textual document where the text stays the same from one copy to another, but the illustrations change, um, this form of video essay is one where the audiovisual dimension is the primary dimension and the text illuminates it. And here the text is illuminating it by giving a very different perspective on what's going on in the studio than might be assumed if you just saw the video. So there are many other video essays that have been published as part of the Judaica project, which I won't go into in detail. Um, all of them similarly explore different ways of relating textuality in its various forms. I'm particularly interested in this, these illuminations. So if you look on the top right, the way there's a citation there telling you what book I've just picked up, um, that's a kind of illumination. Uh, there's also voiceover. There's also, of course, singing in different languages. And there are books in the space which bring their own materiality and their own audiovisuality as well as their own textuality. Um, so I think all of these things are, I also want to mention that the bottom two, it's very important that the bottom two of these video essays on this page are not edited by me. So one thing that I didn't talk about in relation to Journal of Embodied Research, just because I don't have time, is collaboration and co-authorship. But clearly, if we're taking videographic thought seriously, that obviously means that we're taking seriously the idea that the people whose bodies appear on screen are in fact thinking, they are doing thought. And as they are audiovisually recorded, that thought is inscribed. And so we can, we can definitely point to differences between the act of inscription that happens when you write letters onto a page versus the act of inscription that happens when your audiovisual body is recorded. Um, these are very different acts of inscription. But if we take videographic knowledge and thought seriously, then we're definitely assuming that the bodies on state on, on, on screen and the books and the charcoal uh, and, the, and the clothing and the place, the emplacement are all enacting a kind of videographic thought. And that means that the idea of single authorship or sole authorship, the idea of the anonymous sole author, um, thinking about maybe Sarah Ahmed's queer phenomenology, the idea of this author who is seated at a table and they produce their own kind of text, which is associated with them as an individual, is pretty much out the window if you take the layer, if you take seriously the layers of videographic thought, because you can never think that the person who's doing the editing is the only author, right? The very idea of editing. Uh, already means that there is already material there that's already been authored in a different mode. So the co-authorship is really important. It's been very important to me in the Judaica project that I'm not the only one who's producing video essays. So we have video essays on the bottom that are edited by Edda, who you can see there on the bottom right. And now, um, yeah, so I think I'm coming towards the end. I want to touch on my current research, which is very much related to this, very much coming out of this. But um, one of the things that I've found in producing these video essays and video articles is that, well, I think for better and for worse, they're very grounded in the academic institution. And I've been asking myself, how could I maybe try to produce some work that could live outside the academic institution? So maybe having established, you know, that it's possible to produce, that I'm able to produce these video essays, video articles, I could have them peer reviewed, I could publish them in a journal. Okay, so that exists. Um, but and then that's very exciting to me in some way that we could put forward these kinds of things as articles and say, oh, this is an article. Uh, it just happens to be a videographic article. And what does that mean for embodiment? What does that mean for emplacement? What does that mean for identity? What does that mean for performing arts as embodied knowledge in a decolonial framework? That's all very, very interesting. Um, but it's also limiting in the sense that it's an academic article, it appears in an academic journal, it takes a long time to put out. And then, you know, are people watching it? Maybe some people are watching some of them, but it's a very slow cycle. So I've become interested in like, okay, there's a lot of audiovisual platforms, where else might I be able to experiment? And where could I experiment in a way that's lighter? So it doesn't have to be an essay, which is drafted and then redrafted and then submitted and then peer reviewed and then revised and then approved and then finalized this kind of academic process. I'd like to try something a little bit lighter. So 
Um, the current project that I'm working on, which is uh, the next phase of the Judaica project is called Crypto Judaica, and it's an Instagram project. So it's presented primarily on Instagram. And I will again show you a little, a little clip of it with sound. So um, that's just three of the of the little clips that I've posted on Instagram. I've been posting one clip of about one minute long, or exactly one minute long, I think almost every day since about November. So there's quite a number of them up there, must be at least 100, 100 something. Um, these are just three of them from three different phases. You can see that, of course, I'm again looking at how to juxtapose textuality. Um, on the left side, we have a, a quotation um, from a queer indigenous poet, which is just kind of, again, slapped on top of my own studio practice as if to raise questions like, what's the relationship here? But very much the text is in front of the, of the audiovisual layer. The next one, Artistic Research and the Queer Prophetic, that's the title of one of my articles. So it's my little phrase, and it's much more uh, gently put down in the corner. Uh, and on the right side is something that I started to focus on and repeat, which is the idea of a Talmud page. Again, going back to the idea of Talmud and Jewish ways of reading and writing, there's a box of text. Um, and this one is actually from Catherine McKittrick uh, about methods, black methods. Um, and it's right in the middle as if uh, in, a, in, a, in a Talmud page, as if this is, the, this is the quotation that's going to have commentary on it. And the commentary will be surrounding this core quotation. But in this case, the commentary that surrounds the core quotation is not textual commentary, but it's it's audiovisual commentary. It's a layer of me in movement and song. You can also see differences in emplacement as the, the, the clip on the left, clip on the right are both in studio spaces, dan dance theater studio spaces, whereas the central clip is recorded in a, in a ruined and partially restored synagogue in rural Poland. And so that brings a completely different kind of context to that to that particular clip. Um, this is very much a work in progress. So very much something where I'm, you know, I'm soliciting input, uh, I'm soliciting Instagram followers, um, and I'm just kind of exploring uh, different things. Um, so for example, the nigun, that's song, the song. Um, the song is constant throughout all of this practice. I haven't talked about it much today because it's uh, quite specific to my own embodied research practice, but all of the Instagram videos and all of the Judaica Project video essays are structured by song. One thing that I will say about song is that I think it's clear that song as a molecule in the sense referred to before and as a form of knowledge um, is not something that can be isolated to a single form of knowledge. So as much as there are hundreds of years of European classical work uh, in which song is understood as reducible to a form of writing, whether that's the transcription of the words or the European system of musical notation, I think it's clear in today's audiovisual world and has always been clear from a, from a broader cultural perspective that that is not the limitation of what song is. We can look at song in a textual or notational ontology but we have to look at song in an audio ontology today, obviously music, hugely an audio ontology, and we have to look, I think also, at song in an audiovisual ontology or a videographic ontology. So in this space, again, the space of videographic thought, what is a song? 
in that space? And what, what are its potential relationships with a written text, spoken text, a voiceover, with a place, with a body, or with, a, with bodies working together? Crypto is a very important, I'm just kind of touching on these concepts because these are really the current ones that I'm thinking about. I don't, I don't have too much to present on them necessarily yet. Um, crypto as in crypto Jew is very important to me. Again, the Judaica project being uh, gradually coming to realize over 10 years that it was about thinking about Jewishness in relation to whiteness, trying to disentangle um, Jewishness from whiteness through a critical landscape that's deeply learning from Black and Indigenous studies. So in that context, thinking about the crypto-Jewish or crypto-Judaic position as one in which even when Jewishness is not named, uh, even when Jewishness is on a, on a surface level, seems to be entirely absorbed into whiteness, there are always hidden flows of knowledge. There are always lineages and inheritances of knowledge that may not be named uh, as alternative uh, or as Jewish, but which are still present and which are not are not those of the dominant of the dominant system. And finally, something I'm just starting to think about that I just put here as a little little question mark is the figure of the golem. Um, one of the things that I'm trying to do through these Instagram videos is to think non-binary gender and Jewishness together. Um, there is some precedent for that kind of queer Jewish studies. Now, recently, there's more trans Jewish studies. The work of Daniel Boyarin is really important. But in terms of um, some of the ways that, for example, Black trans studies and Black trans feminism have thought about Blackness and transness or Blackness and queerness together, um, I, I, I'm not yet able to understand how quite to think the historical racialization and then the re-racialization, the change in the racialization of Jewishness towards whiteness, to think that in relation to the way in which Jewish gender uh, is incorporated in that. And that's kind of what I'm currently working on. I'm just putting the figure of the golem there as a, as a bit of a question mark, as a, as a figure that might be um, racialized and gendered in, in interesting ways. So this project, as I mentioned, is ongoing. Um, in the Instagram format, which I find you know, Instagram is its own form of knowledge. Um, it's a heavily commercialized form of knowledge, of course, but no more so than El Sevier or Informa, who publish academic, many academic articles and, and books. Um, I am interested in this form, the juxtaposition of the three uh, clips, the idea of the clips being very short and scrolling. It allows for a lot of freedom and playing um, that's not necessarily possible with the heavier form of the video article. Uh, but I think it can also be scholarly. It can also be a mode of, of critical thinking, feminist thinking, um, critical race thinking, critical diasporic Jewish thinking towards um, modes of articulation that, that, that wouldn't be the same as what we could express in even a very poetic form of writing and, and maybe also not in the form of commercial production uh, filmmaking, but in these kinds of new audiovisual forms that are starting to appear. And I think that, that we, we should make more space for that. Um, and, and as people working in critical humanities, um, intersectional humanities, we, we should also be thinking about these, these kinds of videographic possibilities. So uh, thank you. That's what I wanted to share today. And I put on the screen a little outline because I did kind of cover a lot of material. On the left, you have the materials, the audiovisual materials that I presented. On the right, you have the, all the little um, concepts that I, that I tried to track through these materials. And uh, I'd, be, I'd be really interested to hear any kind of feedback questions. I see that there's some things in the chat that we can look at as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ben. That was fantastic. I really appreciated hearing that. I can start with the first question that we have in the chat. And obviously everyone welcome to put, add new questions as we go along. So someone asked, what is the relationship between identities that might be represented by our bodies, like race and gender, and identity roles that we take on or do, like performing artist and critical humanities scholar? Are these different types of identities, and do they inform creative practices differently? In my, in my perception, they're less different than we might think. Uh, certainly less strictly different than we might think. Um, one of the things that I've been theorizing quite a lot, which I didn't engage specifically here, but um, 
Stanley was at a talk a little while ago where I focused on it completely, is the relationship between technique and identity. I'm using the word technique because I've written and thought a lot about technique. It might be a kind of weird word, it might sound like a weird word, but if you think about like Foucault and, and, and Butler and Bourdieu and the kind of theories of habitus and performativity and repetition and inscription, if you think of those in terms of sometimes people prefer technologies of the body, I would say we should really stick with technique in some cases. That's what I mean by technique, um, that the relationship between technique and identity well, I suppose I did say this when I was talking about the as, the as particle, and I said that the as particle works in both directions. I think that um, something that we, that we probably want to avoid, or certainly I would want to avoid, is a strict separation whereby, uh, and I'm going to actually, I've been quoting this for like almost 10 years now, but I'm going to still quote it again. Both Bourdieu and Pierre both Pierre Bourdieu and Judith Butler have a sentence in their work where they say, listen, <laughs> the, the stuff that you are, that you wake up with, that's deeply sedimented in your body is not the same as the stuff that you got just get to choose and you can just take it on or off, right? When I talk about these deeply sedimented gender or class identities, I don't just mean you know what you get to choose or what clothes you wear, et cetera. And you know, I don't, I don't, I don't think they're wrong, and I don't think they're really suggesting a strict separation. Um, but what I do think is that they are writing from a very distanced critical analytical perspective, which is quite different from what I think I've been calling like an experimental perspective or artistic research perspective or practice research perspective. And I think that this is a shift that I'm often um, trying, sort of trying to propose, not that everyone has to make this shift, but like could, you know, might be useful in some context where we have to let go a little bit of this positionality of the academic scholar who is outside and can analyze the sort of existence and movement of static identities had realized that academic knowledge production is a form of knowledge like any other. And that means that it's also available to experimentation and it's also aesthetic. Um, and so that means that um, as, as, as I think probably all of us would agree when we articulate what, when we articulate things as knowledge, we're also constructing the world, right? That's a kind of very basic thing. When we articulate things as knowledge, we're also constructing the world. We're not simply talking about the world. And that means that the things, so coming back to the question, the things that we do that we think of as conscious technique, I'm going to study this field of knowledge. I'm going to read this book. I'm going to write this book um, are not, our identities are not made of other things than that. They may be more sedimented. And they're of course sedimented, not only in our own bodies, but in massive social structures. So I'm not in any way saying that an individual body can simply do whatever it wants. What I am saying is that the stuff that our identities are made of, even the most heavy sedimented, and I'm using molecular language, even the most kind of thick, or Sedgwick says inertial, um, the, the molecules that are hard to bud, you know, the cement that covers the planet, even that stuff, is made of song you know to, to be quite poetic about it even cement is made of song what i mean is even the very sedimented identities that we think of as immovable are made of technique that was invented and learned and somebody decided to repeat it and somebody told other people to repeat it and taught it and people learned it and that's where it comes from it doesn't mean it's easy to change but it does mean that i don't think we would ever want to make a strict separation between these layers of knowledge. Thank you. Okay, so our next question is, how does temporality feature in the concept of doubling and the relationship between textuality and audiovisuality? Does the MP4 format of the Journal of Embodied Research flatten or compress the divergent temporalities of the text and audiovisual elements? That's a great question. Yeah. Um, so I want to say, yes, it absolutely does flatten and compress. Um, I think any thing, I mean, it's a, it's, there's a paradox of mediation where 
it's the flattening and the containment and the compressing that allows the copying and the transmission, which produces scales that are otherwise unimaginable and not present, right? It's the way in which first writing and then printing and then sound and then movies and then the internet can have a thing that's considered an object, which is not really a physical object, it's just copyable that produces these scales of, you know, the scale of society, the scale of the planetary, where we can even think about the politics of the planet to even have any approach towards anything like the politics of the planet or ecology or decoloniality, those scales exist because of these kinds of objects, but the objects are always subject to the means of copying, which means they're always gonna be reductive and flattening. One of the things that I always try to point out about video is that I'm of course never suggesting that a videographic work is some kind of transparent or complete access to life. I think you know we could take as a premise that the relationship between a videographic document and life is, I mean, if we wanted to pretend to be quanti quantitative, it's just as far from life as a written document. It's not closer or anything like that, but it's just different. It's just different. The relationship of an audiovisual recording um, to the world is different than the relationship of a written text. And I think the important point is not to kind of hold up video as like, now we access life. Uh, absolutely not. But rather to, to, to reveal the way in which writing was never thought, right? I mean, I think that one of the core points is like, how often we're still talking about people's thought when what we mean is their writing. It's just very telling. Not that we shouldn't do that, but like, I don't know Judith Butler's thought. I know her writing, you know? Um, and then recently, maybe I know some of her audiovisual appearances. But um, yeah, it's to displace writing and to say, oh, okay, a lot of, a lot of sedimented structures have been constructed on writing as a form of knowledge and specifically European alphabetic forms of knowledge. Huge, massive architectures are constructed on that. Um, and while we've seen the rise of audiovisuality over more than hundred years since the beginning of cinema, maybe the beginning of photographs, um, it's still quite a, quite a different thing to suggest that videographic work, work would, a group videographic document would be treated as knowledge. Um, or as thought. And so, yeah, absolutely. Um, the form of the video article is, 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 is just as uh, compressing and flattening as, as any other form of knowledge, um, transmissible form of knowledge. In terms of temporality, um, the main context in which I've thought about temporality, where, where I've really, it's really become very important to me, is precisely in that relationship between audiovisual recording and videographic thinking. Um, in the Judaica Project Lab that I was sharing from, maybe the most valuable thing that we had, and this was only possible because of an external grant, and I haven't been able to get anything like that since. So it was just the six months in 2017 that was so extraordinary. But in that time, the three of us who were on this project, we were able to over the six months, go back and forth repeatedly between the temporality of the lab space in which we were recording and producing video and the temporality in which we were watching the video, choosing bits of the video to talk about, talking about what was going on in the video. You know, is this, when you did this, I would want to call that this. Oh, I wouldn't really call it that. Okay, let's call it this. The whole process of, and then having had that conversation about what we're seeing in the video and what's interesting to us in the video, then go back in the studio. That for me is very much about temporality. It's about the temporality of the process. That's a very different temporality than almost any um, historical filmmaking, for example. Historical filmmaking is not iterative in that way. You have to do pre-production, production, and post-production. It's an academic research cycle that would give you this kind of like, oh, we do a little thing, uh, let's talk about it and analyze it, and let's do some more, talk about it, analyze it. That's, a, that's a, uh, an experimental um, process and a, um, and a critical 
thinking process, a critical reflection process. I think, yeah, I mean, in terms of how it's flattened or how it's compressed, that's really getting at what I mean by videographic thought, right? Because, I mean, does writing compress and flatten thought? Well, on the one hand, yes, of course it does. I mean, writing can't approximate like real life and, and thought as life, life as thought. On the other hand, um, I mean, who, who can look at the history of writing and, and, and not be amazed at the ways in which people, you know, from poetry to dense critical theory have attempted to articulate things that are real and important through this compressed form. And so I think that's exactly the videographic question of videographic thought is like, okay, we have all of these recordings and now we have so many recordings and now we're gonna have AI produ produced materials. Right. And then we have universes of text. Um, is it all just flat? It all, does it all just become like a flat kind of meaningless collage? Well, no, I mean, if there's thinking involved, then it's precisely about um, what arises from a kind of very rich temporality. I really like Ian Baucom's work that I, and it was cited at one point about temporality, he talks about different scales of time. Um, these very vast different scales of time, you know, that you have to put the scale of this moment. I mean, first of all, from a decolonial historical framing, this moment that we're talking about now, this political moment has to be framed in relation to the history of European colonialism. That's the history of racialization. You can't understand that without the history of Christianity. Um, it, you know, there's these, and, but then also we do also need to think that in turn in relation to geology and in relation to the planetary. So those are the temporalities. And then, yeah, I mean, video for better and for worse enacts an astonishing flattening. I mean, look at the flattening where I'm singing a song in a in this partially ruined synagogue in Poland and you immediately have me in that moment, 2017, artistic researcher person singing this song, which has its own history in this place, which has this very specific history of destruction from the Holocaust, but also has a much longer history prior to the Holocaust of its actual life and use, not to mention the stone and the, you know, the unimaginable temporality of the stone out of which everything is built. So all of that, yeah, video, I mean, how astonishing that video can compress all of these temporalities into a plane. And then what do we do with that? That kind of leads into a question that I had, which is, I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about the relationship between the audio visual methodologies and like embodied sensory experiences. I guess what I'm getting at is, would we benefit more if more sensory experiences or would we learn more? Would there be more knowledge? Maybe that's a wrong way to think about it. Um, but, you know, would we have a more expansive uh, epistemology with if more senses were involved in the audiovisual, or I'm not sure is that a limitation in some way yeah I think it's a very important question and before I started working with video I was theorizing technique and I was theorizing technique in relation to embodied practice so I was very much not particularly thinking about that specific flattening of audiovisuality, And I was thinking about things like kinesthetic empathy and kinetics and movement. And you, know, you can add smell and, and, and various kinds of sensory perceptions that you might have in a space of performing arts practice. Um, one of the things that I always want to make sure we don't kind of have everything upside down. I mean, it's impossible to avoid this, but is that, um, you know, we, it goes back to what I was saying about video and writing that the per part of what video does is it displaces writing and it allows you to see them both as limited but powerful forms of knowledge, where like, I think we, we could never expect any transmissible form of knowledge to encompass human life or the human sensorium. Um, the the primary thing that we're all living through and experiencing and referring to is is life but the scales at which we are interacting with each other are so vast um that i think you know even if we're thinking about for example people working in somatics somatic body work fields um, or, or this kind of thing working with touch there's a video article coming out in the journal of body research soon about touch it's based on a performance around touch so like even if we're working with, with 
the touch, even if we're working with interpersonal, intersubjective, intercorporeal exchange, somatics, very delicate kind of like, um, you know, the, the hardest things to get into, into the audiovisual field. Um, I think, you know, on the one hand, protect those practices. On the other hand, it just seems to me, and this is maybe just where I come down, and I think this actually can be rooted in, in Jewish commitments to textuality for thousands of years, is like, we also have to work with documents. Nobody can escape documents. And I guess I do come out of a theatrical lineage where there has been, well, this is part of the countercultural lineage of the 1970s, where there was this feeling of like documents, it's bad, it's bad, mediation is bad. We need immediate intercorporeal engagement and that's where ethics are. Ethics only exist in intercorporeal engagement. And, um, you know, as I, as I, as I uh, yeah, and, and so ethics, as I mentioned in this other talk that I just mentioned, it's a double-edged sword. Yeah, there's a kind of ethics that inheres with actual interpersonal inter, you know, bodies in a space. But if that ethics becomes a way to exclude politics, then it's a really ineffective ethics. And so that idea of like, we're, we're just gonna be in the space with each other where, you know, there has to be smell and touch and that's where ethics is. I, I don't think there's any, for me, there's no more recourse to like, you know, the politics will come later. And, and, and when I say the politics will come later, I mean the archive, the documents and the institutional form. And that's what I think is interesting about artistic research because artistic research is a claim on the university. And so it has to engage with the archive, the documents and the, and the institutional form. It can't say our thing is over here in a little bubble. It's totally intersubjective, it's ethical, it's intercorporeal, it's based on senses that, you know, cannot, this is a lot of rhetoric in, 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 in the 1970s and 80s around artistic practice. Our practice escapes mediation. We cannot be captured by any form of mediation. And there's this idea of this kind of escape. And I feel very mixed about it. Like, again, I think in some cases, okay, protect those practices. But for me, the engagement with the documents is crucial. And that means the affordances of different documents. And that means what can a text do? What can different modes of writing do? What can video do? Um, and it also means like, okay, so you work with somatics. It's impossible to capture somatics on video, but is it? I mean, it's also impossible to capture flowers in writing. And yet that doesn't invalidate centuries of writing about flowers. So, you know, we need to know that the video will never capture the, the moment, the, the delicate somatic interchange, let alone the internal subjective process, but it doesn't, you know, nothing is answered by that. We still need to ask all of the questions of how to bring all of those meanings into the forms that exist. Absolutely. So we have another question in the Q&A box. It says, you seem to be returning in your talk to the potential of juxtaposition. Could you tell us a bit more about how you have been practicing it or how it might be enabling? Yeah, I think, I mean, that is in a way, I want to say it's very personal, but I also think it goes right back to these same identities that I've been talking about. You know, now that I, now that I have more, now that I'm really trying to think through a critical race and gender perspective on my own practice, you know, it's true that in some way, my core practice is reading and writing. And there's something for me that's inescapable in reading and writing. It's so, you know, and I only, I only find it echoed when I read about um, pre-Holocaust European forms of reading and writing and Talmud study, this kind of feverish engagement with the text, the fervent engagement with the text where it's like, as if you can solve the world through the text, the reading and writing, like if we just could read and talk a little bit more about the text is extremely Jewish. Um, that relationship to textuality and that sort of flow of textuality where like, I'm just constantly reading several books and probably writing several books is something that is just kind of, that feels larger than me. Like it's just a process that I'm part of. I went away from that very intentionally to find embodiment. Uh, and I went to European countercultural 
theater lineages that had borrowed and learned intensively from black and indigenous traditions of knowledge. For better and for worse, those traditions offer a kind of engagement with embodiment that is profoundly informed by specific black and indigenous um, traditions of knowledge and others. Um, but I think, you know, broadly as a grouping, um, I mean, I said we also have to call them Asian, but all of these kind of categories are, are somewhat problematic, but they are, you know, they're these engagements of the 60s and 70s and 80s, um, which are desperately hungry for embodiment from a perspective of European disembodiment. Um, and so they were very, very important to me. They remain very important to me. This kind of engagement with song is something that, you know, it's something very important for my life. Then the question of how I frame that in relation to critical thinking, in relation to my own identities, to the politics of cultural exchange, cultural knowledge, cultural appropriation um, is all for me to be worked out in the videographic process. But I think that's at the heart of the juxtaposition is this kind of like, um, I mean, now, as I'm describing it now, it's like there are these two kinds of cultural traditions, uh, which I've inherited one, not and other people don't relate to, I'm not saying this is how reading and writing are, but I relate to, I, I, so I previously had a practice where I was in the studio. And when I went in the studio, I did not bring books into the studio. That was not a thing. The studio is for movement and song. Uh, and again, this kind of like away with the documents, away with the archive, um, interpersonal transmission only. And then on the other hand, I was, you know, I went away from academia and then I went back to academia and I found that I wanted to write books. It's an anthropologist who's also part of this uh, theater lineage, Caroline Gatt, wonderful anthropologist and theater laboratory practitioner who came and visited our lab in 2017 and brought books into the lab. And my mind kind of, well, my whole self kind of exploded in that moment. Um, from the possibility of books being in the space of movement and song. And so that, you know, I think is part of the engine, these two streams that had been really intentionally kept separate, like here's the reading and writing and here's the embodiment practice and they have to be separate in order to work. And then, so what you get, and this is how embodied research works, you divide them and that's a research process. Then you spend 30 years cultivating these things separately. And then when you bring them together, it's this huge kind of like, oh my gosh, these things could be brought together. What could that possibly be? And the space of videographic thought is that space for me because there I am as a moving, singing body with my visual appearance and all these things. And yet also there I am with my writer, textual, critical self there. And I'm able to, to, to so that juxtaposition is, is very personal. I think that um, in a broader sense, going back to the idea of compression or flattening videographic space, allows for extraordinary juxtapositions and new kinds of juxtapositions that don't, you know, whether it's different people or people in places or people in songs or songs and books, um, there's, you know, these kinds of juxtapositions that we can, that we can make can be very generative. And along the, that line of thinking of juxtaposition and, and interdisciplinarity, um, someone asked in the chat, can you speak more on the idea of audiovisual molecules? Is there a relationship between audiovisual molecules and identity construction? Yeah, yeah, I think there is. Um, I mean, I think that um, so in in the previous part of my work before I was really focusing on video, I was writing about how technique is made of identity, and then. Um, well, I was writing really about how identity is made of technique. And more recently, I'm also writing about how technique is made of identity. But the the idea of molecules I introduced at the beginning um, is this idea that technique and identity are made of the same stuff, as I said before. So identities are just very sedimented technique. And we could even say the places are very sedimented technique or sedimented identities. Um, but I introduced the idea of the molecular through Tiffany Lazabo King's reading of Julie Dash's Daughters of the Dust because he talks about the molecular in this way where it's like, well, how do we know the molecular? You know, let's just say that, that we're going to talk about the molecular in a very free way. And um, in, in some of something I've recently been writing, I, I put um, King's work on these, these indigo or indican molecules, I'm thinking about that alongside um, like Mel Chen writing about lead, but also Paul Preciado writing about testosterone. Um, Kim Talbert writing about DNA. These are all molecules um, that are being 
that are being approached from a critical humanities, critical race, critical gender perspective, and um, and being rethought in their uh, in their in their richness. And and so how do we? You know, I think today, like of course, identities are massively constructed by audiovisual molecules, right? I mean, social media is nothing but flows of audiovisual molecules that we are all, many of us, using to construct our own identities. Uh, I mean, when the molecule of non-binary gender hit me, uh, and it, you know, that's something where it's like you can live with something your whole life and not have a name for it and be like, ah, it doesn't really, do I have to be this thing? And what are the other possibilities? I'm not this other thing. Oh, no. And then a molecule arrives to you, and it arrives in different forms. Like, for sure, the word is very important, but it's not just the word. Um, we live in, you know, in a very mediated situation. And so um, audiovisual molecules, I mean, I, what I would say is like, you know, following Deleuze and Guattari about philosophy as the creation of concepts. What is a concept? Well, in a philosophical, you know, European philosophical tradition, it's a word. And that means it has to be written out, has to be in alphabetical letters, has to be transcribable. That's the kind of thing it is. They're super powerful. Why are they so powerful? Well, it's also because of European colonialism and technology. And again, this is in Frigate Rasmussen's amazing book about European imposition of writing. But like, you know, there's nothing about the word that makes it a word except that the technology of reproduction is still massively dominant. So when we make a word like non-binary, it has this potential to spread uh, and, to, and to be used in all these different ways. Um, and so an audiovisual molecule, like an Instagram post, um, is it's not that it's not a concept because it's not alphabetical and it can't be reproduced by the same technologies, but it does have some of those transmissible reproducible qualities where uh, you know you cross post it to Facebook and it just by posting it on Instagram it's appearing on all these different people's phones and computers so it's got this kind of like molecular transmissible quality that a concept might have but it's not a concept so that's what I'm calling an audiovisual molecule. Very interesting. Another question is, do you have any thoughts, speculative or otherwise, about how we might talk about embodiment in the context of AI generated videographic material? Yeah, this is like, this is, I want to say it's a wave hitting me, but it's honestly, it's hitting all of us, right? I mean, you know, it's been like eight years that I'm thinking about videographic thought in one form or another. And I'm thinking, okay, you know, the audiovisual trace although it's never transparent and it's always informed by the videographic choices made by the videographer and of course by the technology of the camera, it does have this core analog relation to the moment that was recorded. And the developments of AI that we're seeing over the last several months displace that analog relation. They, they mean that we're gonna start having um, audiovisual materials circulating that, I mean, but of course we always had fictional audiovisual materials circulating. I mean, this is again, I don't have an answer to this question of AI. What I can, what I can say, what I think I can contribute is like, let's always think about videographic forms of knowledge alongside written forms of knowledge. Let's always kind of think about them together. So like some of, I mean, some of it is, a. I want to be calmed a little bit by it because like, for example, the, there is a sense of potentially quite valid panic around like, you know, the idea that they, people can make photorealistic images that seem real of things that never happened. But I wonder, I mean, I, it seems to me like that's a shift in how we have to understand the form of knowledge. Like we, of course, if that's true, then when we look at something that looks photorealistic, we're obviously going to know that that doesn't mean it's true. It just is photorealistic. So, I mean, it's it's ever since the beginning of writing, it's been possible to write that somebody said something that they didn't say. There's no, you know, and so that all that does is return us to politics and return us to institutions and return us to like actual structures of of society. But like, I can write that you said something that you never said, and what you have to do is say that I didn't say that, and like, you know. There's, it's a question of institutionality. I think it's a crisis of institutionality and I am quite scared about it. But I don't think it's, I don't think it's a case where like 
innately in some way, if we see something that looks like a photograph, we innately think it's true. I think that's something we've learned about the photographic technology that if there's something that looks like a photograph, it's probably, although, you know, because there's also been fakes, there's been photographic fakes since the beginning of photography. So that question of, you know, I think, I think that the question of truth and accuracy and disciplinary knowledge and institutional knowledge and the power behind all of that knowledge, some of that stays the same. Um, it doesn't go away. It doesn't get better. It's pretty, pretty problematic situation at the moment in terms of what is considered to be true, but I, I suppose it could be a lot worse. Um, I don't know that the technologies instantly change any of that. Um, I think, yeah, embodiment in the context of these things, it's a very good question. Um, I have like the database of the archive from the Judaica project. It's like 500 hours of video of us singing and moving in various places with various people. If you had a capacity to put that into an AI and then generate material of us doing more lab work that we had never actually done. You know, it's like, it's sort of interesting, but on the other hand, I do think that what's interesting is that we did it. So, you know, there's this level on which like, if you can make a document of something that looks like it happened, but it never happened, if it never happened, then it's not that interesting. I mean, I do have this kind of skepticism about those where it's like, well, sure, that looks like that happened, but how different is it really from a drawing? I'm, I'm not setting aside the kind of question of like mass propaganda and populism turning towards fascism. That's a very significant political question, more from the perspective of like videographic thought. Um, if I know that there's something that looks very realistic, but I know it didn't happen, then of course my engagement with it is gonna be based on that as something that didn't happen. And it's not necessarily that different than the forms of animation that we already have. Another question from the chat is, I think about the phenomenology of the mediums you are selecting. You mentioned video a lot, but what is your approach to considering the fallibility of the variations of the medium? i.e. 16 millimeter, VHS, DVT, 35 millimeter, digital, et cetera, as the choices when you when considering the embodied form you are capturing. The AV of all degrade over time, even digital, in different ways, which I find really interesting when we think about the fallibility of the body. Is there a shared ontology, perhaps? But even beyond this, I think of something like three minutes, a lengthening, where the historical document as phenomenological artifact really holds so much possibility, but it is the degraded film stock that suddenly creates something beyond the original footage. Wow, that's a great question and great thoughts and great examples. Whoever said that, let's have another longer conversation about it. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, one thing that's very clear to me um, from, again, the practical perspective of something like journal and embodied research is that the hierarchical approach to so-called production values certainly goes out the window if you're talking about videographic thought, um, because you mentioned three minutes of lengthening, which is a great example. I think when I was founding the Journal of Embodied Research, I was thinking about the Zapruder film, which is like a much more kind of, you know, but similar thing where it's like, the important thing isn't how grainy the film stock is. The important thing is that through it, and again, because of some kind of institutional trust, right? I mean, how do we know that it's all not made up? How do we know that it's, I mean, lots of people think the Zapruder film is made up. So how do we know that any, you know, how do we know that three minutes of lengthening is a real piece of film? Well, there has to be a kind of institutional trust there. But if there is that, then even the grainiest so-called low production work of something of an event that has an analog tie, this is again, the analog tie is really important, has an analog tie to something that happened. That's what's important and that's what we're connecting to. Um, and so the it's a very different approach to, to um, production values. I did a special call last year where we did a special issue and I said, the rule is that um, you have to take one piece of video. You can't have any editing, no cuts, no montage, just the video, and then put textual annotations on it. 
illuminations because I really wanted to explore this idea of illuminating a video. So they ranged greatly in, in duration. One of them was about a minute long. Mine was the longest because I submitted this lab session that was about 30 minutes and everything in between, one minute, five minutes, eight minutes, 13 minutes, 20 minutes. Um, and they also range in production value because there could be a, a cell phone, there could be, you know, anything. And it could also, that could have, nobody, I don't think anyone submitted historical material, but you could take a historical film thing and put it on there and annotate it really interestingly. You know, and again, what I was trying to get at with the whiteness video is like your annotations don't have to be like, this is what happened. This is the data was recorded. I think that, you know, we have to, that, and again, that's why I started with Daughters of the Dust, because we have to think about fictionality as well. And think about like, what what's going on that's of interest in this audiovisual recorded material. Um, so I think all of the history of media archeology span is available in that space. And in that space of videographic thought, um, you know, it does hold, photos and it holds drawings and it holds archival books. Um, Ariela Azule has this film where she's working through, you just see her hands working through all these old objects and books and photographs the whole time. And it's like the videographic space again, and she's talking about what she's holding. You know, this comes from here, this comes from here. Another audiovisual intervention in contemporary Jewish identity politics. Um, but the videographic space is holding the not the objects, it's, and it's very different from a documentary where it's like, you know, the, the image might be slapped on the screen, but her hands with the object speaking. Similar to the video on the top left that I showed from Journal of Money Research where there's a GoPro and there's the commentary. So the textuality, the textual analysis is not added afterwards. Now I pick up this book. It's right in the moment, she's like this. Well, you see this came from here and look at this photo. You know, you can see how the people were forced to move from this place to this place. So the whole, the, the archival body with these very old documents beyond 16 millimeter, like old photographs and old pieces of jewelry, material object. She's working with them, holding them, picking them up, talking about them. Uh, and all of that is held very caringly by a very simple videographic space. And on that same vein of talking about the Journal of Embodied Research a little bit, Someone says, thank you so much for the fascinating talk. I'm curious about the process of peer reviewing a video article. In what ways does it differ from the traditional academic paradigm or incorporate or continue the embodied production of knowledge? Yeah, um, I might have in a way less of interest to say about this, except a sort of ethical commitment to it and how I understand peer review. Like, I think peer review is a very interesting form of knowledge. It's a process. Um, I don't think it does anything related to universal objectivity uh, or anything like that. I think of peer review in terms of communities of knowledge, um, in terms of the development of fields and conversations about where fields should go. So I, I don't see myself as editor, or now I work with a few assistant editors. So when we're choosing uh, peer reviewers, I don't see us as choosing randomly or objectively. Like I, I understand us to be um, shaping the future of the, I think probably the, I said this to, to, the, to the other editors the other day, I said, I think possibly the, the, the act that we do that's most important in shaping the future of whatever fields we're engaged in is selecting peer reviewers. That's the core act of the journal in some way, because an article comes in and, you know, let's say it fits the format of the journal. So I want to get different kinds of perspectives on it. I want you know, on the one hand, someone who's close to the content of the article, but also someone who's far, um, people from different geographical backgrounds, people with different identities, people with different perspectives on the content. I'd also like to get a peer reviewer who I know personally and another peer reviewer who I don't know at all, you know, in terms of creating the journal community. It's, um, I'm, I'm comfortable thinking with that editorial moment as not being clearly distinguished from a curatorial moment. Um, what is different about it is that I'm not curating the articles. It's an indirect process. There's a whole other layer. I'm curating the people who will give feedback to the article. Um, so it's a, that's a scholarly process. But I don't think it's towards objectivity or anything like that. I think it's towards 
cultivating a community of knowledge. So the big question for all of us is how shall I peer review a video article? Um, I think it's, you know, in some very pure videographic world, the peer review of the video article should be another, like a video comment, but we haven't done that. And, you know, the technology isn't quite there yet. Um, so people write a peer review similarly to how they would write for a written article. Um, I, I just try to be very clear that like, there aren't really standards for videographic thought. I mean, we just published in last autumn, a style guide. It's the first time we ever had a style guide. And as far as I know, it's the first videographic style guide. And it says things like, well, I started to write the style guide and then I realized I had to write a whole glossary in order to write the style guide because like, what do I mean by the textual content? I also mean the voiceover, but I also mean a street sign. It's anything that can be transcribed. Okay, so I learned that from the process of writing a style guide. Um, what do I mean by the audio visual content? Uh, but then there's style guide things like we would prefer you to avoid, well, we really want you to avoid incidental music. You shouldn't add music because it kind of makes the mood fun or something, you know, it should be part of the research. Think of this as a research journal, things like that guides where we point, for example, I mean, the main thing is you don't, like, don't make the video for a general audience. It's not a documentary. Make it for an audience of your peers. Who are your peers? That's up to you to decide. But whoever are the people that you understand in your field, which is not only an academic field, it may well be an artistic field or a field of martial artists, um, but the people who you consider your fields in that field of knowledge, that's who you're making the video for. So it just means they don't need incidental music. They would rather have a deep dive. They would rather have shop talk technique details like, they, you know, the people who are already like, but how did you do that? That's the people. Uh, and then that that has, you know, some impact on what we mean by videographic form. But in terms of bigger questions like voiceover versus text on screen, use of fictionality, use of juxtaposition, different kinds of video production, co-authorship. I mean, there's there's massive questions there. And I think we're, you know, the peer peer review, the journal overall, but especially the peer review process is really a, a space for talking about all those things. And it's just similar to if you have a conference only, it's ongoing. And what's nice about a journal is there's always an object, a document object that you're referring to. So it's always like, this voice over here, do you, you know, it's it's too fast, but that doesn't mean it, it would always be too fast. There might be another journal article where that same technique works fine. So it's very, it can be very detailed about like, you know, and then you, and then you, you work it a while and then you put it up. That's really interesting. Uh, somebody else asked, have people considered creating an audiovisual archive or communal archives of movement? If so, do you find these projects meaningful both for communities and also for people in the academy? Yeah, I mean, that's a very broad question. There are lots of archives of audiovisual, there are lots of audiovisual archives of um, movement. I mean, I think you mean sort of bodily movement rather than social movements, but of course there's many, many countless different kinds of audio visual archives. Um, yeah, I guess I, I don't know, in terms of being meaningful for both communities and people of the academy, I mean, I would say that there are, there are still many, communities of practice that protect their embodied practice by keeping it somewhat separate from audiovisuality. At the same time, I think that's decreasing. I think that approach is rapidly decreasing. And I think probably for the good. I mean, there is a part of me that, you know, going back to those 70s countercultural impulses that does, you know, I reserve a spot for like, the fear, which is often articulated to me in a variety of contexts, that the camera will come in and colonize the space of embodied practice and flat it and, and, and suck out all of its life. Um, yeah, I just think that it's not the camera that does that, it's the structure of production. You know, for example, it's the hierarchical position, gendered and racialized, of the director and the videographer who come in and colonize the space and suck out all the life of the space. It's not the camera. So, for example, in our laboratory, the whole kind of laboratory process that that, that we developed um, was based on the idea that the directorial power and the videographic power, the camera power, 
circulate between us always. So there's it's never the case that the, there's one person who's like the director all the time. It's a circulation of, of those powers. Um, so I've tried, I mean, I've had limited success working with say theater companies, dance companies, martial arts groups saying like, wouldn't it be interesting if the camera, you know, I'm not talking about hiring a videographer to get what you do and then they either get it or they don't for but you know, they more get it or they less get it. I'm talking about like you bringing the camera into your practice, wouldn't that be interesting? Of course, there's plenty of theater and, and dance companies who are doing that. Um, I think it's always a question of the institutional context and what people are looking to get for from the documents. Like, of course, people in our dance companies, theater companies, martial arts groups bring um, bring cameras into the space now because then they can put it on Instagram and then they can get more people to join them or they can help with fundraising, et cetera. Um, I think it's limited where you would find that to have a a real critical reflective perspective that would overlap with the kinds of things that a cultural studies scholar or a feminist studies scholar would be looking for if they went into those spaces when they go, you know, there's always that kind of like, what's the role here? I think, um, yeah, there's some really great work recently on dramaturgy the role of the dramaturg, which is uh, this, you know, a person who in some way has a kind of academic background or orientation or is looking to do that kind of critical reflexive work, but not through uh, an exiting of the space and a kind of distance analysis, which can often be quite cold in its critical uh, criticality, but rather through a very collaborative process of, of mutual reflection. And that's, I mean, I think when the camera works in that way, then you can have, then you can start to have audiovisual archives that serve both the community of practice, the local inter, intercorporeal community of practice, and a broad, at a broader outside context. Uh, but I do think that we are in the process now, really, hopefully, of developing those techniques of the camera. Thank you so much, Ben. I think our time is coming to a close now, and that feels like a good place to end our conversation. But really a massive thank you to our speaker today, Dr. Ben Spatz. And thank you so much to all of the attendees for joining us today and for your wonderful yeah. questions. Really thank appreciate it. Thank you so much to thank you so much to you, Sammy, and to everyone who asked questions. And My pleasure. Really wonderful. Thank you. Awesome. Everyone, please do follow the